Thank you, Madam. Science operates on factual data and experimental evidences. It doesn't draw the line between good and bad. What science can tell us and what it cannot. The best scientist to elaborate on this is Professor Iqbal. Professor Iqbal is a graduate of University of Peradeniya. He obtained his postgraduate degree, Master of Philosophy, from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Switzerland and the PhD in plant breeding from the Institute of Agronomy and Plant Breeding in Germany. He received many presidential awards for his research publications in science. He is also fluent in English, German, Sinhala and Tamil languages. We are indeed fortunate to listen to him today. I cordially invite Professor MCM Iqbal, Associate Research Professor of NIFS, to address with you his with you address you with his wise words of wisdom. Right, so good morning to all of you and uh, in addition to welcoming you all, I understand that we are also, this is also being streamed live over Facebook. So to those who are watching us live, uh, we welcome you too. So before I get on, let me first clarify a few things that was said in the introduction. I am fluent in English, single I can speak a little, Tamil I understand. I, I do speak German, so I'm not very fluent in Sinhala and Tamil. But of course, you can ask questions which I will attempt to answer. So as has already been told to you, this is the 43rd program. <coughs> so which means it's quite possible that some of your parents may have followed this program in the 80s. So this is going to be continued for years to come and perhaps even your children might come and follow these programs. And uh, many of those who follow these programs are in very eminent positions in Sri Lanka at the moment. Uh, I should also emphasize that the lectures that you're going to listen during the next three or four days has nothing to do with your A-levels in two years' time. These lectures are meant to widen your horizon, to show you things that you usually would not encounter in your teaching at the schools. And in other words, as uh, Dr. Kumari pointed out to you, to arouse your curiosity so that you can, you have an impetus to go and search for more interesting material. So it is in that context that my talk is also planned. And uh, during my talk, if you find there are issues that you don't understand, please raise your hands and uh, ask your questions. And then, of course, we'll keep the big questions to the end of the program. So the talk today is about our genome. and. Uh, the genome, you should not think that the genome is only for students doing biology. In fact, the genome is for everybody. So we are very familiar with a um, lot of instruments we use, machines we use, like the computers, uh, machines in the laboratory, or even a car that you have to drive. All these come with an instruction manual. In other words, how we should use this manual. Uh, how you should use this instrument, or, or even the computer. For example, the computer runs on an operating system. It has a software. But our own body, we never think that uh, there should be an operating system for our own body, too. And how does it function? We never think what brings us from our home to this place, uh, the things that we carry out in our daily routine. We just take it for granted. So. 
the uh, objective of this talk is to go a little behind and look inside our bodies to see what is going on and also what can go wrong. So our book of life, that is our body, uh, uh, for example, the, I t uh, told you about instruction manuals. These are always written in a language. For example, the English language with 26 letters. But our, the program that runs our body is written, also written in a, with a genetic alphabet which has only four letters. And these four letters are what are called these bases called adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, which of course should be familiar to all of you because all of you did biology or the whole level. So this can be re uh, regarded as the genetic alphabet. And uh, where do you find this, uh, all this written? All this is found, as you obviously know, within our cells. And within the cells, there is a, a nucleus. And within this nucleus are chromosomes. And it is in these chromosomes that this entire program to run our body is found. In addition to this, we also have another independent small organ called the mitochondria. And this also has DNA. So actually speaking, our genome has two components. One is the nucleus and the mitochondria. And of course, I will be coming back to this mitochondria towards the end of my talk to show why it is important. This, of course, has what is called a circular uh, DNA. So genomes, the size of the genome has, a, has obviously nothing to do with, the, with our own size. For example, something as uh, small as the goldfish has 94 chromosomes. The dogs have 74, much more than what we have. The elephant, although it's very large, has 76. And uh, a fern by this name of your glossum has 1,260 chromosomes. So the number of chromosomes has nothing to do with the complexity of the lives. Uh, this also shows you again the complexity, the, the number of uh, nucleotides. Don't worry about that. But what you can see is that the plants have the large genome, animals also, but things like bacteria, fungi, have a much smaller genomes. In fact, even the mouse, and the human genome are almost uh, close to each other. So to look at a little more about this DNA, the DNA is actually a very long thread-like structure. In fact, you can compare it to a thread wound up on a reel. Uh, it is coiled up. Now, one chromosome has been taken out here, slowly uncoiled. And then it, you will find this is the reel. The, this, uh, beige colored things called proteins, these are called histones. And around this, you find two windings of the DNA. And if you unravel it, you will find that eventually it comes out into what is something like a ladder. It is like, so if you actually take two, uh, two strands of thread and twist them, you will end up with, you will end up with this uh, twisted ladder-like structure. In fact, uh, the discovery of this in the 50s was a monumental breakthrough in the biological fields. And this was done not by biologists, but by chemists, uh, by the names of James Watson, Francis Crick, and uh, Wilkins, uh, who were given the Nobel Prize at that time. Right, so this is a little more of a uh, schematic view of the ladder. And uh, these are the bases that I told you earlier, the four letters of the genetic alphabet. And these are, of course, due to their molecular structures. They can only, the A can only fit with T, and the C can only fit with G. So otherwise, uh, I mean, the A cannot pair with C or G. OK, so what is interesting is we have 3 billion pairs of bases. So each, this is one pair, this is two pairs, three. We have 3 billion pairs, and of these, only 2% are necessary for the genes that we have, the genes that control our lives. Well, just only 2%. So 98% was called junk, but now scientists no more call it junk because they also find interesting things there, which are necessary to switch on and switch off genes. Now, remember that all the cells, each cell has the same DNA. 
but we have different cells. For example, the cells in our eyes, the cells in our muscles, in the heart. So it's the same program, but what happens is that in the different types of cells, genes are switched on and off. And these switching on and off is believed to be done by some of the junk DNA. Actually, the junk DNA has a lot of other useful things we will uh, discuss that later. So who are our closest relatives, genetically speaking? Can anybody guess? Who is our closest relative in terms of genetics? That is, in other words, with this other animal, we share a very large percentage of our genes. Anybody? Yeah. Banana. Okay, is there anybody else with a better guess? Well, I'll give a clue. It's uh, it's uh, it's to do with the animal um, with the monkey kingdom, or the, uh, you call them the apes or primates. We share 98.5 percent of our genes with that. Um, the chimpanzees. We share 98.5. This says 98, but actually we share about 98.5 percent. And can you guess with whom we share 97.5 percent? It's with the mouse or the mice, the rats that we have at home. We share 97.5 percent of our genes. With the bananas, we also share uh, much more, uh, but not as close as this. It is simply because that the uh, genes that we need for our daily functions are common. I mean, we all need to respire uh, glucose and burn it into sugars and energy. I'm, I'm sorry, not burn it into sugars, but break it down into uh, simpler compounds and release energy. So these are all common chemical reactions, and all these are controlled by genes, so therefore the genes are common. But this is uh, very uncommon that we share such a lot of genes with chimpanzees, but in, sp in spite of the fact that there is such a lot of differences. For example, we don't eat raw food except for fruits. We always need our food cooked and spiced. They are very happy eating the raw stuff. We are shy to be naked. We need clothes. That's no problem for them. We need homes to live. They are quite comfortable on trees. We kill each other. We fight each other. They never do such things. We need laws and religion to tell us what is right and wrong. Not for them. So all these things is within this 1.5 to 2%. So what is this 2% responsible for? Actually, the primary difference is the size of the brain. We have a larger brain, whereas the chimpanzees have a, a, little, a much smaller brain. We are also able to make sounds from our throat. Our, the throat, our throat functions, <coughs> enables us to make uh, vocal noises, which although chimpanzees can, they are much more limited. And because of these sounds, we can communicate with people, with each other. And through communication, we have developed languages, culture. We sing songs, we play the piano, we can play chess. So a lot of things is uh, due to these brain sizes and also the fact that we can make sounds. We can also walk upright. We can uh, walk upright, so therefore this has freed our two hands to make, uh, to make use of other things. And we also have what is called our thumb, which is called op opposable. That means the thumb can move independent of the other fingers. And this allows us to handle tools, which is limited in the apes. So these are some of the reasons or uh, things that they have found within these 2% of genes. Right, so um, we'll look at another aspect of the genome, and those are the errors that occur in our genome. Our genome can also, there can also be mistakes. So we'll look at some of these mistakes, which we are familiar with in everyday life, but which 
of which we are probably not aware. Uh, before that, we will, I will just give you a primer on how we are formed. We have 46 chromosomes, if you remember the number of chromosomes I showed you in the earlier slide. And when we reproduce, we have a sperm that comes and joins with the egg cell, fertilizes it, and then we get back the 46 chromosomes. In fact, if, this does, if, the, if the sperm and the egg cell do not have 23, our chromosome number is going to go on doubling. So there is an elegant method which brings the 46 chromosomes, which makes the 46 chromosomes into 23, and the combining these two, we end up with, uh, again, 46. This single cell, which has all the genes, divides into a ball of uh, cells called the pro-embryo, which all, of course, has 46 chromosomes. And then over a period of 10 months, it develops from embryo and into a tiny baby. This is something you would have seen in everyday life. In fact, uh, uh, this condition is called the Down syndrome. And this occurs, and the features are, of course, these are children who are very short, chubby. They look like, uh, people call them, they look like Mongoloids or Chinese. They have a rounded face, small flattened nose, narrow eyes. And uh, what's, very, what's perhaps very interesting is that these are people who never fight, who have no jealousy against anybody, they have a very good, uh, they have a very good uh, mind, and uh, they are no ill will against anyone. In fact, they are very friendly people. But how does this happen? In fact, these features were described by Dr. John Down in the UK in the 1866. In 1866, and the genetic reason how, why this happens was found in, 19, in the 1950s. And the genetic reason is, uh, I'll come to that, is just due to a single chromosome. And uh, I told you earlier about the di uh, dividing cells. Uh, I, I will just let me just go through this so that you, explain, uh, you understand the next slide. Uh, we, have, we have 46 pairs of chromosomes. Let's just take one single pair. Uh, so in the cell division, what happens is, the chromosome splits into two, but it does not separate. It splits into two, and we still have one pair of chromosomes, but each one is split into two, and these are exact copies. Then after that, these chrom the pair of chromosomes separates into two cells. So now we, instead of two chromosomes in the cell, we have one chromosome each. This is technically called a diploid cell. This is called a haploid cell. So this happens only in our reproductive cells. In the men, or in the males, it is the sperm, and in the females, those are the egg cells. In fact, this happens in the plants also. Plants, you call this pollen. Again, you call them the egg cells or ovules in the, uh, for the female. So now we have the split chromosome, and this split separates out, and we end up with four cells. So these are the four, ce uh, four haploid cells which has only half the number of chromosomes we had at the beginning. So if you, so one pair, we have one. If we had 46, we would have had only 23 now. Right, so Down syndrome, what happens here? The genetic basis was discovered in 59, and the basis was that there was one, the chromosome number 21 occurred in one addition. That is, you can, so this is, these are all the chromosomes in the human body, and you can find the 21 here has one extra chromosome. So the presence of one extra chromosome actually disturbs the entire uh, machinery, the genome, and we end up, this is illustrated also here, and we end up with a child who is uh, quite different from children who do not have this anomaly. So what can be done? Usually the chances of older mothers, say over 35, 40, having babies with Down syndrome increases. It occurs every six out of 1,000 babies. And usually there are a lot of embryos in the mother which are lost when these abnormalities occur. But this 20, addition of 21, the, the embryos usually survive. 
and uh, how you can prevent it is that is if you want it to be prevented you can actually take out the amniotic fluid from the mother when she's pregnant in this 16 to 20, 20 weeks do a chromosome count and then determine if this chromosome 21 is extra then the mothers have the choice of either aborting the fetus or not this of course depends on on the country also because certain countries don't allow uh, the fetus to be aborted right so we'll come to something else I'm still looking at the genome and abnormalities in the genome another interesting abnormality is with the sex chromosomes um, we all have 46 chromosomes like I told you 23 pairs and of these 23 pairs one pair is responsible for the sex determination of all of us if we have the females have what are called two X chromosomes you can see down here they're both similar and the males have one X and one Y chromosome and actually the Y chromosome is much smaller than the X chromosome in my notes given to you you will notice that uh, I would have mentioned that the Y chromosome is actually contracting it's, it's, uh, it's, it's becoming smaller and smaller so one group of scientists in fact estimated that the Y chromosome might disappear in of course it will take a few million years and what will happen then if the Y chromosome disappears well because without the Y chromosome there can't be males and if the Y chromosome disappears that is quite possible that the males also might disappear in one day but of course millions of years ahead of us so this is how the sex chromosomes behave in the humans the father has X and Y the mother has X and X so when the sperms are produced there is one sperm with X the other one with Y the mother of course has only X chromosomes and depending on how they combine you end up with either a girl or a boy so what is uh, beautiful about this whole thing is that we end up always with 50% boys or 50% girls so this is why we have equal number of boys and girls or men and women in the world but occasionally things can go wrong for example this Y can end up here and we will see the consequences of those when X and Y do not separate like I showed you in the earlier slide if the X and Y do not separate and both X and Y end up in one this is what happens from mom you have X and X chromosomes from the dad you have X and Y in one sperm and the other one of course there is no there are no chromosomes so when they combine you end up you end up with XXY XXY here of course uh, there are no chromosomes you have only X and X if you have this condition it is called Kleinfelter syndrome and these are the symptoms uh, uh, given there where and of course uh, you should keep in mind that if there is a Y chromosome it will always be a male so in other words this condition will only come about with males uh, in this condition there are no Y chromosomes so it will always be females and uh, what happens is uh, you end up with what is called Turner syndrome and this is usually where the neck is found to be uh, quite different from the necks of the other it is called a webbed neck uh, and also there are also other other complications I'm not going into that but these are the main features of these two um, errors in uh, XY separation but there is a much more interesting thing and this is uh, what is called actually there are Superman uh, what happens if there is a condition where uh, the Y there's an additional Y chromosome then you end up with because it is Y you will it'll, like I told you earlier that we'll always have men and uh, this condition what happens is this occurs once in thousand births and the presence of Y means only females and the boys grow up to be normal men but they're always taller they're much taller and there is one small problem and that is their IQ their IQ is less than the normal person's IQ and also people have found in social surveys that 5% of the prison population are people with this XYY 
You have to do a chromosome count to find this out. You take the chromosomes from the cells, you have to stain them and in the laboratory you can count them. Otherwise, you, it's not obvious. So obviously, we can be very sure that there are no XYY people here because for one thing, they are not so tall, the boys are not so tall, and also, you all also have a more than average IQ because otherwise you won't be here. So if you want to find these people, you have to go and uh, look in the prisons, which is a very common place to find. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not very common, because only 5% end up in the prisons. So this fact was used by lawyers to argue in courts to say that my client can't help it. It is genetically he's, uh, prone to do uh, criminal activities, and therefore that is why uh, he has ended up here in the courts. But then uh, scientists said that although 5% end up in the prison, the other 95% are not in the prison. They're actually outside the prison. They are quite uh, normal people. So that argument did not hold. And uh, also they said that the reason why these uh, people end up in the prison is because they're not very smart enough to escape from the law. So because they are a little bit stupid, they end up getting caught and they end up in the prison. Right, so uh, with that, I come to the second part of my talk, and that is the good and the bad in science and technology. Because uh, we will see that some of these genomes can be manipulated, and then how good or bad it is for all of us. Okay. That is the good in science. Science has brought about a massive revolution in agriculture, information technology, transport, health, communication, knowledge. These are the, all the good things the science has done. But the science has also done, sadly, some bad things. Do you, yeah, I think, uh, can we have a few uh, suggestions from you all where science has gone wrong? the consequences of scientific activity, which has uh, ended up being a burden to society or, uh, or a disaster to society? Can you think of certain disasters that have come about due to science? I think you should be able to answer that. That's, that's quite easy. Yeah. Weapons, yes. Weapons is one, and what are weapons? Weapons are actually chemicals, explosives, which chemists have created in their laboratory, and which is used to create a lot of uh, harm to our society. What else? What are the other disasters or their science has gone wrong? I need two more things before I talk ahead. <laughs> Otherwise, we are going for tea. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I want somebody else. <laughs> Maybe Kumari can read out a uh, number of the students. All the students have a number, so I think uh, <laughs> that is an easy way of asking you all to answer Krishna. Yeah, 78. Yeah, let's have 78 raise the hand. <laughs> Who is 78? Yeah, what is the disaster that, I mean, I'm sure you, you know this. Not a natural disaster, we have a lot of natural disasters like floods and uh, landslides, it's, but a scientific disaster? You can tell in uh, single is uh, Tamil, doesn't matter. Or can we have another number? 52. Nuclear weapons, yeah. Nuclear weapons, in fact, uh, I'm going to show that to you also. Yeah, thanks. The nuclear weapons, what else? So these are all weapons, but uh, can we look at things other than weapons? Yes. 13, so that must be right in front somewhere. 
who is 13. Yeah. One, one disaster where science is all. I mean, I'm sure science is right on all these things, right? But science has also gone wrong. Can, can, you, repeat, can you repeat that? Gamini, what did you say? Yeah, there are bad websites. So actually, we are misusing IT technology, uh, information technology to create web, bad websites for children and also well, there is all child pornography and etc. So this is this is another place where science has gone wrong. So you see, science can go wrong. It's actually not that science has gone wrong; it has gone out of control. Science and technology has also generated a lot of uncertainties and failures in our lives. We have created technologies that we are unable to control. For example, what he said just now. IT is a good thing, but it has gone out of control. We don't have regular, we can, cannot be regulated. The frequency of disasters in our lives has also increased. So list some disasters, this is what I wanted from you, but now you have already given me three. And these are the more, dis more other disasters that I want to show you. So this is the Hiroshima, the nuclear disaster. Chernobyl, where the nuclear reactor exploded. The space shuttle that exploded again, engineering gone wrong, mad cow disease in um, the UK, and this was of course in the 1980s before any one of you were born, where the Union Carbide factory uh, developed a gas leak and lots of people died in India. So you see there are two types of disasters. These are single event disasters, it's like a plane crashing. But there are also global disasters which are continuous, like the ozone hole, oil spills, desertification, uh, global warming, loss of biodiversity. So these where well, things have gone wrong and uh, we are having disasters continuously over time. And this is just of course a single event. So that brings us to the fact that science has limitations. Science is not something without limitations. So science is, we should always keep in mind that science acts or can act only on what we can observe. What is not observable, science cannot uh, explain such things. And also only what is in this universe. What is outside this universe, science cannot explain. What is outside this universe? What is outside this universe? <laughs> Well, one place is heaven and hell, those are outside the universe. <laughs> so science cannot explain what, what is going on there. Science always operates on facts and observations, what you can observe and what are facts. Uh, science cannot evaluate subjective judgments. That is, subjective is something that only uh, each one of us can decide for ourselves, not objective. Science cannot answer questions on religion. Okay? So, Lots of people try to use science to say that religion is wrong or they try to explain religion in terms of science. That is not possible because religion is not a, cannot be observed and it's also, it's, it, you can't also classify it as a fact because it is based on, based on belief, faith and reasoning. So these are, you should keep these two things aside. So a, a scientist can be a, can be a very devout, uh, uh, can have a very devout uh, religious life, or he can also be otherwise, he can be an atheist, but uh, religion is based on belief, faith, and reasoning. In fact, uh, a few years back in the 80s, there were three Nobel Prizes given in physics, and one of them came to the IFS, Abdus Salam, Steven Weinberg, and I forget the third, they were given the Nobel Prize for particle physics, and Abdus Salam, he was a Muslim from Pakistan, he was a very devout Muslim, whereas Steven Weinberg was an atheist. So you see, uh, religion has nothing to do with uh, how eminent you can be in your scientific life. So in addition to that, there are also limitations of science with the, of the tools available for us to use. For example, the, to look at the smallest thing, we, need, we can use the microscope and the, to see the furthest, we need to use a telescope. 
So all these, both these things are based on, the limitations are based on light and also the lenses that they have. So beyond that, there is a limit beyond which you cannot see. And therefore, what we can observe or the facts that we can gather is again limited by the tools we have. But of course, these tools keep on improving over time. Nature also has limitations, for example, the speed of light. That is a constant, and anything beyond that, we cannot uh, deduce. So does science have answers to everything? No, science does not have answers to everything. So science is limited by all these things, and therefore it does not have answers to everything. So now I'll come to an example where science has been used in the genome uh, to do something. The science can do it, but the science cannot decide whether it is correct or wrong. That is something we have to do. And this is what is called the three-parent baby. Now, this three-parent baby will uh, go into this. Uh, this has actually been loved in the United Kingdom now, just a few weeks back. They are, uh, I think the parliament has okayed that uh, this manipulation is allowed, but whereas in many countries this is not allowed. So what is this? So what this is, is uh, again we have to go back to the mitochondria that we spoke of earlier. We have the cell, the genome, and we have the second genome, the mitochondria, and this mitochondria, if something goes wrong in this mitochondria, you know what, what is the mitochondria uh, used for? To produce energy, right? This is where the glucose is respired and produces energy for our cells. So if something goes wrong in this, the body does not have energy. It's like having no power, right? If the power station breaks down, it's like the, it's like the power station in our bodies. We are not going to have power. So this occurs at a low frequency in certain, in certain uh, uh, humans. And when this occurs, there's no, way, there's no way of repairing it. So when a mitochondria is damaged, if it affects the energy production and in that cell and tissues, and there's no treatment. Right, so the solution was, actually this is what scientists found out. Scientists don't bother about whether it is right or wrong, but they found the solution. So the solution is, so here we have this mother is affected uh, by this mitochondrial disease. It doesn't matter if the father is affected because the father does not contribute mitochondria to the baby. If you look at the diagrams earlier, the egg cell has the nucleus in the middle and the mitochondria in the cytoplasm, but the father produce, gives only the chromosomes. So that is the egg cell from the mother. The mitochondria are mutated and therefore they are not normal, but she has a normal nucleus. So we'll allow the father to go out of the scene and we'll bring a new mother into the picture. And this person has healthy mitochondria. So one solution is you take this nucleus out and put this, uh, bring this nucleus into this. Right. So that, is a, that can actually be done in the laboratory now. And that, this is how it is done. You can, uh, using a suction uh, pipette here, you hold the egg cell, this is the egg cell, and you can, using a tiny pipette, you can actually pierce through the egg cell and suck out the nucleus, and then put it into this. Um, actually, the egg cell, the wall, you can puncture through with this tiny uh, pipette. It's like these cars which have self-sealing tubes now. If it goes over a puncture, it, although there's a nail, it, the, the tube seals itself. It's, it's something uh, similar to that. Right, so we have the nucleus has been removed and that nucleus taken out and put into this. So the bad egg cell has been uh, thrown away and now we have the, now we have the egg cell with good mitochondria and with the nucleus from the mother. So this contributor, this mother can go out of the scene and now what we need is the parents 
we need the father who is going to contribute the sperm. And the sperm, like I told you, uh, contributes only the nucleus with the 23 chromosomes. And uh, the child is born with, uh, without the abnormal mitochondria. But what does this child have? The child has the genome from the father, from this mother, and also part of the genome from that other mother. In other words, this child has three genomes. It has two mothers and one father. So this is an ethical dilemma. A new DNA in a child other than from the dad and mom. We are not treating humans, we are creating them. This was told by a journalist, uh, Jennifer Kahn, I think. And uh, if we give permission for these things to happen, there will be other manipulations that, will, that scientists will come up with. So what is important here is that science does not provide the answers for these ethical questions. Science will provide the technical solution. It, uh, for example, the, the nuclear bomb, again, was a misuse by humans. The idea in finding out how the nucleus can be uh, split apart and energy released was not to create a nuclear bomb. In fact, the good uses of it that are uh, the powerhouse, the power stations, the nuclear power stations. But a uh, lot of findings in the, in the sciences can also be misused. Like, for example, the chemical, chemical weapons in the Middle East, uh, which was a big problem for George Bush during the Iraq war. So those are again developed in the laboratories, but misused by, uh, so, uh, by uh, the military establishment. So what is the reality in science? Science provides us a state of knowledge based on our senses and the instruments we have. So that is the reality. And this reality will keep changing with new data that we have and new instruments that we have. If when you walk around the IFS, you will see that we have much newer instruments now which allows us to find out things which we could not do when the school science program started. So in other words, there is no absolute certainty in science. Science can only tell you what is available now. So is science useless? No, not at all. It is the best method we have at the moment to understand the physical world. It would, have, it would always keep advancing, and there is no, there is no boundary. It, can al it will always go on forever and ever. So when we come up with something, and this is something that you all are going to do in your life, you all are always going to come up with uh, activities, with programs, with projects that will generate something new. And when you, s when and this something new, you should always ask. And these, these were formulated by, not by scientists, but by social scientists. And this is why social sciences are also important for science. Um, when we come up with something, we should always ask, what is the purpose? Why do we need that? Will this hurt anybody? Can it be misused to hurt anybody? Who benefits? Humankind or somebody else, some establishment? And how can we know? So these are basic questions that we will have to ask ourselves instead of just walking into laboratories and producing things when we have to do our routine work. So, what are you going to take home today? From this, I have summarized. This is what you should take home. Our genome is composed of DNA, the chromosomes, and uh, mitochondria. Of the 3 billion pairs, only 2% code for genes. Genetic errors can be repaired. And science is limited to what can be observed. And it does not answer ethical questions. I think I'm a little over time. And with that, I come to the end of my talk. And that brings us all to the session where you ask questions. Thank you. No questions means you have understood everything very clearly what I said. Or you didn't understand anything.
Yeah. Can you give the curve? Yeah. Uh, but how to get two Y chromosomes? This happens when the Y chromosome splits, but does not separate. Okay, thank you, sir. And I have another question as well. Uh, in Down syndrome, uh, in Down syndrome, the twenty-first chromosome is diploid. Uh, it remains diploid, I think. So, uh, is it a defect with the sperm or the egg cell, or can be bo in both? It's the egg cell. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, always from the mother, because when the mothers grow old, uh, actually the machinery breaks down, right? The division, the separation, these things break down. So therefore, the separation does not occur properly. And unfortunately, I, I don't know for what reason, this, has, this always occurs with the 21st chromosome. Thank you, sir. can ask in other languages. I think there are people to translate and help us out. Uh, So no questions means no tea, huh? because we are waiting. We need three questions from you before we go for tea. Right, so we have one question coming, so we need two more questions. Yeah, of course that is possible. But here the problem was that the, you have a parent, you have a child, but this mother does not have normal mitochondria. So to overcome that, we bring a, what is called a surrogate mother. Uh, it can be anybody, you know, everybody has normal uh, mitochondria. So the purpose of that person is only to contribute her egg cell without, the, without her nucleus, because if it is her nucleus, it is her baby. Yeah, that's uh, because uh, I, I think I showed that earlier also. When the egg cell is fertilized, wait, let me go to the Yeah, so if you look here, <coughs> the egg cell from the mother contributes the nucleus as well as the cytoplasm. The sperm gives only the chromosomes which goes into the egg cell. Only the chromosomes. So the mitochondria is already here. So you have only the chromosomes from the sperm which enters the Excel, and therefore none of the mitochondria from the sperm comes into this. So in other words, this is also used 
to trace our ancestry. For example, we are supposed to have evolved from Africa, and therefore they call it the African Eve. So this was traced using this mitochondrial DNA. They can uh, look at how old the mitochondrial DNA is. They can uh, do dating. They have a technique using uh, the rate of mutations that accumulate in this, uh, in this circular DNA in the mitochondria. And then they found that we most likely originated from some uh, mother in Africa. So the answer is that uh, the sperm only contributes the chromosomes, whereas the mother's egg cell contributes the cytoplasm as well as the, her own chromosomes. And in fact, all this, this has the mother's uh, cytoplasm. OK, we still have two more questions, because that question doesn't count. <laughs> All right, there's one question here. Superman, yeah. I'd uh, like to know about super females no, and the features um, of I heard about that. Uh, no, I, uh, I'm not, actually the, the word super is used here because uh, these super males are very, la very large, very tall. Yeah. Uh, there isn't, although there are certain women who have two Xs, they don't uh, grow very big, mm -hmm. right? So that is why it is called a superman. I mean, in other words, he, although it, we call them a superman, he's not c capable of any super abilities, you know, like the superman you see in the films. So this superman is only because he has an extra Y and also because he's very tall. But uh, don't forget, he has a low IQ. So he's not very super. <laughs> okay. So we have one more question. You see, it takes some time, so I think, for the questions to come. And then when the questions start coming, we can't stop all from questioning also. So I hope we don't come to that stage. <laughs> well, so now, uh, regarding the Superman, my question also goes to. Now, uh, the Superman has X, Y, Y chromosome. Yeah. And then uh, you said that the Superman's IQ level is low. Mm. So now uh, the Y chromosome has been doubled because the Y chromosome has been uh, duplicated but not split up. So then uh, due to the reduction of IQ level, so what's the reason now, uh, now uh, normal people have normal IQ level, as you say, and uh, people with double Y have low IQ. So th does that mean that uh, the IQ level is uh, given by the Y chromosome and all the IQ is suppressed by Y chromosome or something like that now because there must be a reason for the Y chromosome to be doubled and IQ to be um, low down. So then, uh, does that mean the Y chromosome suppresses one's IQ level or something? Uh, very frankly, I don't have the answer to that. But the answer could be it's similar to the Down syndrome also. You also notice there that there's an extra 21 uh, chromosome number 21. So when the chromosome numbers are more than what should, they are, what should be there, there is probably cross interaction between these chromosomes, which suppresses uh, certain activity of the cell. Probably, but um, scientists have still not worked out why. Uh, so chromosomes should have their normal complement. Otherwise, they don't function. Uh, I, we can take another example from bananas, all right? Bananas don't produce seeds. Why don't they produce seeds? Because they have more genomes than they usually have. The banana is what is called not a single genome. Like we have only one genome. All the animals have only one genome. But bananas have more than a single genome. And these genomes interfere with each other. And therefore, uh, sexual reproduction cannot take place. But there are other plants which have additional genomes. For example, wheat, the fl white flour that we use, it has additional genomes, but there are the chromosomes can pair with each other very well, and uh, there's no problem. Also with the mustard, abba, which we use for our spices, that also has three genomes. But again, the some chromosomes can separate and uh, divide with each other, so therefore there's no problems. So when there are additional chromosomes, they can interfere with each other and also bring about problems. 
Okay, any more questions? Yeah. Mitochondria disease, Vanda, Epri Vir Vala Mudu. The question was if you have mitochondrial disease, how can, how can you survive? Uh, you can't. Actually, what happens is uh, if the mitochondria, everything is destroyed, then you can't. But here, uh, let me go. So here you will find that uh, there are a lot of mitochondrias, not one, although there's only one nucleus, there are a lot of mitochondrias, and all these mitochondria are not affected, but most are affected. So there are a few uh, mitochondria which are okay, but it is not enough. It's like, you know, there are many batteries which are dead, but one or two batteries are okay, so you'll have a very weak power. So those uh, children are not very energetic, they are not very active, and uh, they will die before their lifespan. But they have some energy. Okay. Uh, is it possible to, uh, our genetic issues could be uh, I, di I didn't get the first part of your question. Uh, is by cloning method, should, yeah. we, so, uh, shall we get a solution for genetic issues? Um, cloning is where the genome is uh, another copy of the same genome is made, right? So, in other words, it's like twins. You will have a number of people who all look the same. In fact, if all of you all were clones, we can't say who is who, right? But cloning is not allowed, ethically it is not allowed. Because what will happen is, if cloning is allowed, uh, people will select the best genes available, like good IQ, people like Usain Bolt who can run very fast, or, or like Samunga Kara who can bat very well, they'll put all, try to put all these genes into one person. And then we'll have the Superman. So for ethical reasons, cloning is not an option. Uh, what is possible is genetic engineering is possible. That will be the answer to your question. So no, it's not cloning, because cloning is not ethical, but engineering is possible. Cloning, uh, editing the genome is not possible. It is not allowed yet, because of these reasons where I told you. That is possible. Yeah, if there is a child has a disease, caused by a particular gene that can be taken out and a good gene put back. That, so that is the solution, but those are things are not allowed yet now, not yet. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we'll take a short break. Tea is arranged at the lobby. You all can go to the lobby and enjoy the refreshments. But please be kind enough to return to the auditorium sharp at 10.45 to proceed with the rest of the program. Thank you.